Hi everyone, I'm Anuka the Racing, fertility physician and doctor mom, and here to educate on fertility. I have been doing a series of videos on different IVF protocols. There are many different IVF protocols and we do our best to individualize the protocol to the patient. In this video, we'll be talking about the microdose flare protocol. And my hope is, is that this is a helpful resource to patients and that it will help walk them through the process. And with that, we will start with the microdose flare protocol. Let's start with how do you prepare for the process? So one of the first things we recommend is healthy lifestyle, diet, and exercise. So in terms of diet, we usually recommend the Mediterranean diet. So lots of fruits and vegetables, healthy fats like avocado, olive oil, poultry, fish, these type of things. In terms of exercise, so we don't want you exercising during the actual stimulation process, but in preparation for IVF, exercise can be important. So we recommend four to five days of good cardio for 30 minutes, intermittent weights, just overall trying to be healthy. In addition, we want you to avoid processed foods, try and avoid alcohol and smoking and minimizing caffeine. In terms of supplements, so we usually recommend prenatal vitamins, vitamin D, calcium, these type of things. And if we're concerned about ovarian reserve, then we would also recommend CoQ10 and DHEA. So these are some of the things that you can do in preparation for the process. The overall idea of IVF involves a woman undergoing stimulation, so she's going to take injections so that her ovaries will produce multiple eggs. Then we will remove the eggs with a minor surgical procedure called an egg retrieval, and then we'll have the eggs in the lab. The egg and sperm will then meet in the lab, and then we have an embryo, and then we'll put the embryo back in the uterus at a later time. So that is the overall idea of IVF. Now, there is a series of steps involved, and we're going to go through each step in detail. Step one is birth control. Patients will call with the first day of their period, and then we'll start them on birth control around cycle day two or three, and they will remain on birth control for a period of two to three weeks. While the patient is on birth control, the patient will also come into the clinic and do a couple visits with us. So one visit will be meeting with the physician, and with the physician, we'll go over the process again, answer any questions, and sign consents. In addition, we'll do a couple of procedures with the patient. So one is what's called a trial transfer. So what this is, is basically a practice run at putting the catheter in. We just don't wanna run into any surprise on the real day that we're putting the embryo back in. So that's why we do this practice run to make sure it's a nice and smooth process. The second procedure is what's called a saline ultrasound or hysterosonogram. I have done a video on this and I will link it here. But basically what's involved is we will inject saline into the uterine cavity. This will dilate the uterine cavity so we can get a good inside look at the inside contour of the uterus. And we want to make sure there's no polyps, fibroids, adhesions, anything that might decrease our chance of success. The last thing we'll do with the patient is a clearance ultrasound. So we will do an ultrasound, particularly looking at the ovaries and making sure there are no cysts there and all the follicles are small, ideally less than 10 millimeters in size. So that is all of the things that you'll do with the physician at that visit. The other visit that you'll do is with the nurses and with the nurses, you'll do a medication review. They do a very thorough medication review going through all the medicines and going through how to use them. Then you'll also create a calendar with the nurses. And so they will do a nice job of laying out the timeline. So that is also very clear. Step two is stimulation. Stimulation refers to the process of stimulating the ovaries to grow multiple eggs. So I first like to go over what happens in a normal cycle versus what happens in IVF so you can get a good understanding of both and how they're different. So what happens in a normal cycle is a certain number of follicles are released and become visible on ultrasound. So one of those follicles will grow to be the dominant follicle to eventually release the egg in a process called ovulation, and the rest of the eggs will die off. The next cycle, another set of follicles become visible. So in a cycle, you're not losing just one egg, but you're losing a whole set of eggs. Now in IVF, the hope with that is that we give medication so that instead of those eggs dying off, we want them all to grow. So hopefully we get multiple mature eggs from that cycle. So that is how the two are different. Sometimes patients will ask me if IVF affects future fertility. It does not. The only difference between a normal cycle and IVF is that instead of those eggs dying off, we're trying to grow them so that hopefully we get many eggs from the IVF process. Stimulation can be broken down into two components, essentially. So the first component is stimulation. So these are the medications that patients will take to stimulate the ovaries to grow multiple eggs. And this is FSH and LH. 
The other component is suppression of ovulation. If patients were to take the stimulation medicines alone, they could ovulate and then we can lose the eggs. And so that is not what we want. So the medication to suppress ovulation in this protocol is Lupron. So let's go over the process in a little bit more detail. So after the birth control, patients will then start taking Lupron and they will start this on the third pill-free day. And Lupron again is to suppress ovulation. On the third day of Lupron, patients will start the stimulation medicines, the FSH and LH. So patients will initially be starting with two injections a day because Lupron is twice a day. And then when they start the stimulation medications, they will be on four injections a day. The duration of the injections lasts anywhere from 8 to 12 days. It just depends on the woman and her response. And we will monitor these patients with blood work and ultrasound every two to three days for a total of usually four to five visits. We try and make them in and out in the morning so we don't interfere with work. And then we'll call you in the afternoon with the results and the next steps from there. Now let's go over the medication so you can be a little bit more familiar with the terminology. So the stimulation medications, again, are FSH and LH. So FSH comes in gonal F or folistim. LH can be done a few different ways. Sometimes we'll do microdose Ovidrel, which substitutes for that LH component, or a medication called Menopure, which contains both FSH and LH. So examples of protocols could be, for example, folistim with microdose Ovidrel. So you're getting both the FSH and LH component or gonal F and Menipure. So there are a few different ways that we can do the protocol. And then the medication to suppress ovulation, again, is Lupron. Step three is the trigger. When the follicles reach the right size, we will trigger ovulation. And the point of this is for the last steps of egg maturation. The timing of the medication is very important. We will time the egg retrieval 35 to 36 hours after the trigger. The most common trigger that we use in this type of protocol is a medication called Novorel. Number four is the egg retrieval. The egg retrieval is a minor surgical procedure that we do to remove the eggs. It's done under ultrasound guidance and with anesthesia. So how the procedure works is once you're under anesthesia, we will put a speculum in and we will perform a lavage, basically a cleansing of the vagina. Then we will put the ultrasound probe in and there is a needle guide above it. We will feed a needle through that needle guide and it will go basically through the vaginal wall and into the ovary. When it's in the ovary, we will step on a pedal. This will activate a suction mechanism. So we're actually suctioning the fluid out. Each follicle, in theory, has a microscopic egg that we can't see. So as we're removing the fluid, the egg should be coming with it. It'll travel through the tubing into a test tube, and then we hand the test tube off to the embryologist. They'll look through the fluid under a microscope and identify the eggs. The procedure length varies depending on how many eggs are there, but generally speaking, it's about 15 to 20 minutes, and patients will go home the same day. Step five is fertilization. We will obtain a sperm specimen the same day of the egg retrieval and the egg and sperm will meet that same day. There are two ways to do fertilization. One is with conventional IVF and the other is with ICSI, which stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection. With conventional IVF, we put a certain number of egg and sperm on a petri dish and let them meet on their own. With ICSI, the embryologist will identify the best looking sperm and will directly inject the sperm into the egg. Some reasons why we do ICSI is if the patient had a previously low fertilization rate in the previous IVF cycle, if the eggs were previously frozen, if the man has a male factor, or if we're planning PGT. So we usually plan in advance which type of fertilization method we are using, but sometimes on the day of the egg retrieval, if we see lower number of sperm than we anticipated, sometimes we'll decide to do ICSI that day instead of conventional IVF. Step six is embryo development. We will let the embryos grow in the lab for a period of about five to six days usually. The embryologist will be calling the patient and giving them periodic updates on how the embryos are growing. Once the embryo gets to the blastocyst stage, which usually happens after five to six days of growth in the lab, we have two options. We can either put the embryo back in, which is called a fresh embryo transfer, or we can freeze the embryo for the plan of putting the embryo back in in a later cycle, and that is called a frozen embryo transfer cycle. Doing the frozen embryo transfer allows us the option of doing PGT, which stands for pre-implantation genetic testing. This leads me to step seven, which is PGT or pre-implantation genetic testing. What this is, is screening the embryos to determine which embryos are genetically normal. How it works is when the embryo reaches the blastocyst stage, the cells have differentiated into the inner cell mass, which becomes a future baby, and the cells on the outside of the embryo, which is called the trophectoderm, and those cells become the future placenta. 
So PGT means we are taking a sampling of a few of those cells that would become the future placenta, get the genetic makeup of those cells, and extrapolate the genetic makeup of the embryo that way. So we get the chromosome number, and there's 46 chromosomes, so it's a very thorough test, and we get the sex, and you can choose to know or not know the sex depending on your preference. It's overall about a 96% accurate technology, so it is very accurate, but there is a small error rate there. The benefits of doing this is that it helps us to increase our success rate and decrease the miscarriage rates. If we do PGT, it takes about two weeks to get the results. Number eight, meeting with the physician. About three weeks after the egg retrieval, we'll meet with the patients, we'll go over the outcome of that cycle, and we'll review family goals, and we'll see if their goals were met with that IVF cycle, and then we'll discuss next steps from there. That is IVF in a nutshell. I hope you guys found this video helpful. If you did, please give the video a like, subscribe down below, and if you have comments or questions, please leave them for me there also. Thank you guys again so much for watching and see you in the next video.